Oh, gee, Rose, and today we're going to be talking about a paper called Thinking Here and Thinking There, The Transcendent Interplay of Eminences of Memory and Imagination. This was inspired by a talk on Mr. Niebuhauser's channel with uh, Axel and Mr. Gormez on artificial memory, uh, the production and this kind of question of memory, the phenomenology of memory, what is memory. Um, and for me, it opened up a lot of very interesting questions because, you know, memory is uh, clearly a thought that corresponds with reality. I like the language of coherence and correspondence. I find that helpful here. And so a memory is when you recall something that occurred. Whereas imagination is to recall some, or is to think something that did not occur, or to recall something that didn't occur that you think occurred, and so on and so forth. You know, we can associate um, memory with an actua with actuality, and we can associate imagination with um, non-actuality. Now, we have to be careful because we can imagine something that happened, even though we ourselves did not undergo it. We can imagine something that will happen, even though we don't know it will happen. So we have to be careful not to conflate imagination and false. In the same way that we have to be careful not to assume that anything we think is a memory is actually a memory. You know, maybe I have this memory of going to my grandparents when I was five years old for Christmas and having a egg casserole. Well, that never occurred, actually. I went to my friend's house to have an egg casserole, which was like my grandparents, so the, the thoughts got conflated in my mind. And so, um, and so I think it's a memory, but really it's a bringing together of different fragments of events into a new whole, which is imagined. So that's what's interesting, too, right? I mean, you can, you can um, imagine something that's made out of memories, um, bring memories together into a totality that is not itself a memory, uh, but something more imagined. So it's very interesting because the lines between memory and imagination are very, very hard to draw. Now we can draw them critically. We can draw them um, with reference to our lives and our actual lives. And even if we cannot practically determine the difference between memory and imagination, we can theoretically determine those differences. So there's a, so there's a meaningful distinction between memory and imagination of which we can um, associate with actuality the diff in correspondence, the difference between correspondence. Memories cohere and correspond while imagination just coheres. Um, and of course, we can also associate memory with the past. Um, we, and, as we, and what's kind of interesting is as we move from thinking about the past to thinking about the future, you can generally see that as a movement from memory to imagination, where the past is memory and imagination. The present is kind of this memory slash imagination, which is interesting because there's no such thing as the present, really. <laughs> there is a no now. It's always gone just, you know, gone just as soon as you think about it. Um, and also, too, we never fully take in everything around us. We're always engaged in, in interpretation and understanding and um, you know I'm understanding this bookcase here as I understand it so there's a there's a degree of imagination involved but then the second ago in which I originally took in the bookcase is now in the past so now it's a memory and my understanding of the bookcase is um, is partly due and greatly indebted to memory and so memory and imagination are very linked in the present whereas when I think about the future it's pure imagination uh, because I'm not in the future yet um, now of course I can imagine the future as being like the present and thus it can be informed by memory but it's much more imaginative based I, I cannot um, believe Th that um, when I think about the future, I, that that thought corresponds with reality by definition because it is in the future. So there's this interesting move as we go from past to future of memory to imagination. Um, but what's really interesting to me and that what I really want to focus on is the strange fact that memory and imagination are actually very similar um, or they seem very similar or they're actually very hard to tell apart. I can only tell them apart through correspondence, which is in reference to my reality. Um, but, the, but, the, but the critical point is that actually I couldn't determine from the mental scene itself if it's a memory or something imagined. Now, again, I want to stress, I'm not saying that there are not meaningful distinctions between memory and imagination. These are very useful categories. Um, there's a paper we did on absolute moral conditionality, which is this idea that um, not all killing is murder, but the category of murder is always wrong. Uh, the issue is, though, that we have to determine if killing falls under the category of murder or maybe just killing. 
Uh, to determine that, you have to know the particularities of the killing, of the circumstance, to see if it falls under the category of murder. Well, likewise, you can almost here talk about kind of absolute epistemological conditionality, which is to say that memory is always about a thing which was, while imagination is always about a thing which wasn't. Um, but determining which particular mental scenes fall under the category of memory and which fall under imagination um, re requires examining the particularities in reference to our actual experience. Um, now, you can also even get into like cultural memories. You know, I personally did not experience Mo Pearl Harbor, but the culture has a memory of Pearl Harbor. So in a sense, Pearl Harbor is a memory to the culture, even if it's something more imagined to me. Uh, see, it, it, that gets into some different nu nuances complexities there. Uh, but the point is that um, the distinction is a categorical distinction based on actuality, um, the correspondence of the mental scene to actuality, um, but determining which particular mental scenes um, correspond and which do not requires examining the particularities. Um, now, what I'm going to argue though is, be is because you actually cannot tell the difference in the mental scene to itself between a memory and imagination is that essentially, essentially versus accidentally, to use that Aristotelian term, both memory and imagination are acts of quote unquote thinking there. Um, that there is no structural or operational distinction between thinking and uh, between uh, memory and imagination. Both are thinking there. Uh, if there was, we could tell them apart from within a place of eminence, which is to say from within the mental scenes themselves without reference to a transcendent, transcendent point outside the mental scenes, that transcendent point being us. Now, I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there, but let me, let me explain. Um, so imagine in your head right now that there is your living room, imagine your living room, and imagine a pink elephant in it. Well, the pink elephant screams at you that this is imagined, that this is not a memory. The object of a pink elephant, you know there's no such thing as pink elephants. You could, you could imagine a Sasquatch or a uh, Star Wars character if you liked, but we'll go with the pink elephant here. And so there's a pink elephant in your living room, and you know that this is, a, um, that this is imagined because there's a pink elephant. Um, now imagine the elephant uh, as a normal elephant that's just kind of gray. And let me ask you this: Is this imagined, or is it, um, or is it a memory? Now imagine it's a small elephant and that can fit in your living room, and you'd say, "Well, it's imagined." Well, why do you say that? You'd say, "Well, it's because um, I've never seen this elephant in my living room, therefore I must be imagining it." Well, fair enough, but notice that you're referring to your experience to determine this. There's no law. There's no law that says it's impossible for there to be a gray elephant in your living room. Maybe it came in there when you weren't there and, and left or something. But it is theoretically possible for there to be a gray um, baby elephant in your living room. But you are you're going, oh, this is imagined because you are comparing the scene with what you have experienced and you are going, um, this did not occur, therefore this is imagined. Um, but now just imagine your living room. Just imagine your living room. Is this a memory or is this something you imagined? I think you could easily say this is a memory because you remember your living room. You are, I said, imagine your living room, but really you're kind of recalling your living room. Well, the living room was in all three of those things. Uh, it was always there. So at most we can say it was a mixture of imagination and memory. Um, but notice that your ability to tell the difference between a memory and something imagined is relative to the object. Um, the pink elephant told you it was imagined. Um, the gray elephant told you that it was imagined but possible, so it could be a theoretical memory, um, even if it was not pra practically one because you never experienced it, while your living room was a memory because you can recall it. Notice that the scene itself, kind of in its substance and its ontology and your experience of it didn't change, but the objects in the scene changed, with the last scene being an example of the object of the pink elephant removed. Um, there's nothing ontologically per se or substantively about the mental image which transforms simply the object. And the object told you if you were dealing with something imagined or if you were dealing with a memory. Um, but not the scene itself. There was nothing in the scene itself that told you, but the objects in it. Um, so the difference between imagination and, um, and memory is, is not substantive, but accidental. Um, it is not an essential difference, but, it, but it's a difference relative to the objects in the scene. So the scene itself, the mental act itself, is essentially identical. And to, and to, to make the point, um, to take the point even further, um, 
There is no law in all possible universes, and you'd, I mean, you'd have to be God to know this, that says pink elephants cannot exist. Uh, is, it, is it really a law of the universe that says there cannot be pink elephants? Uh, to know that, you would have to be God, and you're not. Uh, I'm not either. And so we're not outside of all possible universes to see that no pink elephant exists. Um, so even the recognition of the pink elephant as proving imagination is a privileging of our experience. It is a privileging of our experience. Um, it is not actually the mental scene itself that is telling us that this is imagined, but us comparing the mental scene with what with what we believe is possible and what we have is, have experienced in reality, in the material world, in physicality. And we are privileging that as a standard by which we can determine correspondence from non-correspondence or the possibility of correspondence. Um, everything that can be experienced can be a memory, even if it's not a memory, but it could be a memory because it is possible. And if it could be a memory, then we cannot say that it is essentially distinct from memory. It, it's just yet to be a memory. We can't say it's not a memory. Uh, we can just say it's not yet a memory per se, which would ontologically mean that it's, it's essentially the same as a memory that we are having or um, that's based on a correspondence of the past. A, something that will be a memory in the future is essentially an ontologically identical with something that is a memory now. Uh, and so it goes with what could be a memory versus um, what is not a memory. Um, if it is possible in some universe for a pink elephant to be a memory, um, then for us to say that the mental scene of a pink elephant is imagined is to privilege our experience. But we can't actually draw an essential ontological distinction between the mental image of the pink elephant and the mental image of the gray elephant or the mental image of just our empty living room. These are all um, sus substantively equivalent in of themselves, which is to say that in their eminence, in the closed system of the mental scene themselves, they are identical. The distinctions are simply in reference to us, which is to say that we are, which is to say that we are transcendent, transcendent points of the mental scenes, um, and that these transcendent in that the transcendent point of us makes it possible to draw distinctions and to give and to give meanings to the scenes of which are not possible to arise to in the scenes themselves. You know, another way to think of this is take a book like um, For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. You know, that's a novel about the Spanish Civil War. But I would submit to you that there is nothing in the novel which would force us to realize the novel is a work of fiction versus a work of history structured like literature, to take um, Hayden White, for example. If you were to take For Whom the Bell Tolls, rip off the cover, rip off the name Ernest Hemingway and just drop it in a, a village somewhere where people didn't recognize the novel, and then you were to ask them, is this uh, nonfiction? Uh, that's structured like literary, literary, literary fiction, or is it just fiction? I would, I would argue you wouldn't be able to tell. You know, granted, if you're reading a science fiction book, uh, you can say, oh, well, this is clearly fiction because I haven't experienced that. Uh, but if we're dealing with literary fiction that's based on true events, um, you actually could not, to the novel, to the story itself, tell if it was fiction or nonfiction. We only know that For Whom the Bell Tolls is fiction because, one, it's in a book called Fiction, um, uh, it, but, but mainly because we because we are comparing it with the eminence of our experience. Um, you know, we, we can only tell for whom the bell tolls is um, literary fiction as opposed to nonfiction structured like literature because of the title page, because of the name, because we recognize the story. But without those signals, uh, you would not know. And in fact, to d identify it as fiction, you'd have to refer to the actual Spanish Civil War, which is to say you would have to refer to something transcendent of the text which all this language of eminence and transcendence is going to bring us to Kurt Gödel and the incompleteness um, theorem. Um, the idea that Mr. Gödel gave us with the incompleteness theorem is that no closed set um, can be its own grounding. It cannot justify itself, um, which is to say a closed system, which, which is what the word eminence means. Uh, eminence in philosophy is this, you're, it's something very close to you and something you are stuck in. But we can also use the term to refer to kind of a closed system. Um, or a system of which we cannot close. We, we, it's, it's a system that we're kind of stuck in, but we can't, we can't complete it. it. It's closed, but it's not completable. There, there's nothing we can do uh, to, to complete it. It is in its incompleteness.
um, closed and finished. So eminence is this interesting closed system that is unable to complete itself. Um, in this sense, closed and complete are not similes. Um, but the idea of Mr. Girdle is that if you have a, a set, the set cannot axiomaticify itself, it cannot justify itself without referring to something outside the set. Uh, and this was, of course, devastating to, at the time when it came out because it was believed that it would be possible to, um, to uh, justify, to, it was believed that it was possible that coherence and correspondence were two sides of the same coin, per se. That if you could find a perfectly coherent system, it would necessarily have to correspond, correspond with actuality. But what Mr. Girdle made it clear is that you could have something completely coherent and it not co correspond with reality, that it could be complete in one sense and yet in that very completion be incomplete. It could be completely coherent and yet incomplete in the sense that it does not correspond and this, this was devastating. Um, what you get from Gödel that Zizek and other people will pick up on is the idea that within an eminence, in order for the eminence to be meaningful or to be um, defined at itself, uh, to be understood, it requires a transcendent. Now, for someone like Zizek, that would you know that means you need a god. God doesn't exist, and so we're stuck in this state of complete incompleteness per se, this um, incompleteness where the I end is parentheses. Well, what we're arguing here is something very similar applies to identifying a mental scene as imagined or memory. Um, the mental scene itself is complete. You, you cannot define it. You cannot determine its meaning um, if it's a memory or of imagination in the mental scene itself. In order to tell if it is imagined or a memory, you have to refer to your experience, which is transcendent of the mental scene. Therefore, giving the mental scene meaning uh, to figure out uh, its definition and what it is, you have to refer to a, tr tr a transcendent point, that being us. What, what this means is that imminently memory and imagination are equivalent. Relying on correspondence to establish the distinction requires relying on a transcendent, which is our experience and us. We are not in our mental scenes. We can have images in our mental scenes, but we're not participating in it. Even if the mental scenes only exist because we exist, and sure, surely thinking um, necessarily requires materiality. No one is saying that ideas don't require materiality. But once, but ideas can also not be reduced to materiality, or they cannot be given meaning without reference to materiality, which is not located in the idea itself, even if the idea is thanks to physical neurons. Uh, and this gets into, say, Alexander um, Ilong and Bard's uh, vector theory, which is going to talk about the irreducibility of mind and um, the irreducibility ability of biology to chemistry, chemistry to physics, physics to subphysics, where every single vector is irreducible to every single other one, even if there's some sort of causal relationship between them. Um, so similarly, we, we, we cannot, uh, precisely because um, thought is eminently equivalent, that it's all thinking there, as I like to call it, that it can only be defined with reference to a transcendent point um, here in the physical. Um, then, then this would suggest that we can't reduce thinking to physicality, um, because that it has a radical distinction to it. Uh, another way to put this is if thought, um, if we cannot in thought itself determine correspondence with materiality, uh, then in what sense can we reduce it necessarily to materiality? Um, in what way can we say it is not its own thing, seeing as it is its own complete coherence? It is able to sustain itself to itself, now to be given meaning um, into different, to be uh, defined into categories between memory and imagination, it must refer to us, but to itself, it can maintain its own eminence and coherence. Um, so why should we necessarily think that it can be reduced to materiality? Or in what way can it be reduced to materiality if it is coherent? It, there's nothing in it that requires uh, materiality to be what it is now. Yes, to come into existence, to uh, materiality is necessary, but that doesn't mean once it emerges that it can be reduced to materiality. Um, necessary and reduction, reductionist, uh, you can't treat as similes. So for example, a, it is, an engine is necessary for a car, but you can't reduce a car to an engine. Um, likewise, materiality is necessary for thinking, but you can't reduce thinking to materiality. Uh, thinking is its own eminence, its own closed system, as materiality is its own closed system, and yet they seem to dialectically relate. And this is incredibly strange, and this starts to point toward the main point I want to make. Um, we know the thought of a giant green lizard, say the size of a plane, doesn't correspond with experience or the material world, but that is only because we have experience to compare the giant green lizard with. The image itself of the giant green lizard cannot unveil its material correspondence or lack thereof. Yes, the giant lizard is composed of color shapes and the like, which are part of the material world. 
Um, but the giant green laser cannot be reduced to the material world, which is to say we cannot claim the thought was just caused by materiality. We created the thought, and this arises to, I think, an important distinction between caused and created. And even if creation is not possible because of causality, it is only possible because of causality. We cannot treat creation and causality as equivalent. They are not the same mental act. Creativity seems to be more emergent and dynamic. We are capable of something irreducible to materiality. And I think this is important to realize because I think a lot of the meaning crisis that Verveke describes is a, re is a result of reductionism, as Long and, and Bard will discuss. Um, so if we can really be mystified by thinking again, to see it as this strange creative act that cannot be reduced to materiality, I think that will go a long way to fighting the meaning crisis. Um, and you see, if we... I think what ends up happening with thought is because we mostly think of it as memory. Okay, so what, we'll, what we end up doing is going imagination, like imagining the pink elephant is this weird act and it's kind of silly. We want other creativity. We say it's silly and it doesn't really count and it doesn't correspond, so it's not real. Whereas real thinking, quote unquote, is memory. Well, memory is recalling experience. So if you, privilege, so if you really emphasize memory as being real, um, then, then real thinking is corresponds with materiality and therefore seems and strikes us phenomenologically as reducible to materiality. If real thought is memory and memory is just recalling experience, then you begin to th kind of associate all thinking with material. And therefore it seems to be nothing but material. Now that logical jump doesn't make sense, but I think it's what we naturally tend to do. Um, and so then thinking is just nothing more than a recalling of materiality. It's nothing special. And so the human is incapable of anything special. Um, and so the meaning crisis gets worse. And this is especially going to be the case if you treat imagination as other and different and weird, um, which then can be aided by the, socio, um, the, the socioeconomic order, which may condition us to think of creativity as playing and a waste of time. Well, if we take seriously that you cannot meaningfully draw a difference between memory and creativity, um, then all thinking is special, just like the creative act. It is all strange. It is all something that we cannot simply reduce to recalling experience. Um, if we take seriously that you can't tell the difference between memory and creativity, then, then all thinking becomes very the special case, per se. It all becomes a creative act. Um, and real thought and creative thought become equal. You start breaking down this hierarchy. And that means thinking um, thinking can finally begin striking us as um, strange again, as really weird, uh, honestly. Um, you know, if we cannot meaningfully or axiomatic claim that all thought isn't a product of the same strange and creative process which generates imagination, um, then whatever process defines imagination is the process which we cannot say doesn't define all thought, for both memory and imagination are imminently um, identical. Uh, and I think this is really an important move um, because I, I really want, like I said, to make sh thinking strange to us again. We're not, we're not bewildered by thinking anymore. We've, we're very used to it. We see it as just recalling experience. It doesn't create wonder in us. Um, and I think without that wonder, then yeah, you end up falling into the meaning crisis. You begin falling into um, mental illness and, and things like that. But if you really, really are struck by the creative act of thinking and the strangeness of thinking, um, then I think this can go a long way to seeing wonder in life and wonder in ourselves that we are able to incubate in our heads, um, which is very, very strange. And if you take this strangeness seriously, then it's a mystery and mystery can be inspiring and inspiration can help life have meaning and help us overcome mental illness and things like that. Also, I wanna take another move I want to make in the same way that we cannot uh, well, and, and, and this would all mean that thinking is a painting, not just a photograph. And if we follow Hans Ruckmacher, which Michelle has been doing a series on, you know, paintings are inherently ontological and metaphysical. They point beyond themselves. They point to something more. They point to the ideas and thoughts and metaphysics of which are behind them um, and that make them possible. Uh, where we think of thinking as painting, then, then there's something to uh, explore and to consider and there's something mysterious going on where if thinking is just a photograph, well, it's just a photograph and photographs have a way of just being photographs to us, all of which therefore can contribute to the meaning crisis. Now, now the next move I want to make uh, uh, is the idea that, so we've established that you can only tell the difference between memory and imagination by, re by referencing a transcendent point from the, the mental scene, which is us. 
Well, funny enough, we can also, so, so we need that transcendent point to make sense of our mind and to understand it. Because, you know, if you couldn't tell the difference between memory and imagination, it would be very difficult to, uh, to know how to live, <laughs> to know how to organize yourself in the world because you couldn't tell what was imagined and what wasn't, what corresponded and what didn't correspond. You know, when, when your mom actually told you to cut the grass from when you only imagined she cut the grass, you need those distinctions in order for thinking to be useful and meaningful. As some theologians will argue, you need God for the world to be meaningful and something you can organize meaningfully. Well, actually in the same way, in the same way that you need the transcendent of materiality to make sense of the eminence of the mind, you likewise need the eminence of the mind to make sense of the eminence of physicality, um, which, which the mind is a transcendent relative to physicality as physicality is transcendent of the mind. Um, if you didn't have a mind, everything would just be impressions. Uh, this bookcase over here would, would not be a bookcase. It would not be definable from the wall. Everything would be merged together into this giant central impression that you couldn't make sense of. Um, it would all just blur together. The ability to define things apart and to make them meaningful and to make them things other, other than this giant incomprehensible blob is thanks to the mind, of which cannot be found in its fullness in materiality, even if materiality is necessary for it. And please note this, this um, distinction I'm trying to draw between necessary and emergent and yet calls, where the, the mind can be caused by materiality and not be reduced to it. Um, is how I'm trying to avoid a dualism that you find in Descartes. Similarly, I want to stress that we the, the world uh, requires the mind to make sense. So it's kind of a two-way street as opposed to this notion of the mind being uh, fullest and most real reality. I, I would like something more dialectical, something more Hegelian, something more like absolute knowing. Um, as we as we will touch on. Uh, but anyway, the entire world, uh, all of physicality, only makes sense because it can refer to the transcendent eminence of the mind. The mind is transcendent of physicality in the same way that physicality is transcendent of the mind. And as the, the transcendent of physicality makes it possible to make the eminence of the mind meaningful, in the same way, the um, transcendent mind makes it possible to make the eminence of physicality meaningful. So there's this very interesting both ways that's occurring, this dialectical both ways of these relative transcendences of which our eminence is in of themselves, but transcendent, but transcendent relative to the other eminences that make it possible for all the eminences to, um, to have meaning. It's almost like a symphony orchestra that plays different parts that brings out the other parts but requires the other parts to be brought out and to have something to participate in that can meaningfully be called a symphony or a symphony. Um, and so you need both eminences to function as transcendence of one another so that they can both have meaning. Uh, they both require one another. Um, and so you need to, so if there's no thinking there, um, then you can't meaningfully think about here, but if there's no thinking here, you couldn't uh, meaningfully define or understand thinking there. So there and here have to constantly interplay and they make possible the meaning of one another. But this would suggest that the human is a very strange between entity where we're this kind of point where these um, eminences that are transcendent of one another that give meaning to one another meet and uh, intersect and dialectically interplay. And we are this strange point where these, these two eminences come in contact, which would suggest why we are so paradoxical, prone to irony and dialectical, um, and which would suggest uh, why we, we need to rethink um, our identity and our classical A is A ontology to something more AB. Um, because if indeed humans are this unique point where eminences collide, then that would have onto, that would ontologically suggest something and it would be worth exploring what that is. Um, the paper will end by discussing how coming to terms with here thereness, this bothness that we are, is part of absolute knowing, that a, a critical component of absolute knowing is really, really um, understanding the limits of our mind to give itself, you know, of mental scenes to give themselves meaning without reference to a transcendent, but also to come to terms with how, with how the physical world um, is limited in its ability to make itself meaningful without the mind. So there's this inherent lack
that both eminences have because they lack the other that they need to be given meaning um, and in and, and a fundamental incompleteness and that we are the interplay of those incompleteness that in their incompleteness give one another meaning, which is very strange. Uh, and that coming to terms with all of this is, a, um, is the art form of absolute knowing that is found in Hegel. Now there's an entire paper on absolute knowing that's at the end of Reconstructing it is a part two. Um, but a big part of absolute knowing is the here thereness, where where you really come to terms and live in the space of the here thereness, and that can be associated with how like when you read a book and there's a movie playing in your head and it's like the most mysterious and weird thing on planet Earth. How in the world is there a movie in your head as you're reading a book? So you're here reading a book, but you're also there in the movie in your head. So you're in this double space of here thereness, this this between space. I think the act of reading really brings out this weird state, but I actually think this weird state is cons is a defining feature of basically all of our experience. And the more we come to terms with it, uh, the more we are absolute knowers, as opposed to say um, reductionist materialistic, uh, as opposed to say materialist materialists, or say idealists, where we privilege idea over matter, or we're materialists who privilege matter over ideas. What we really have to do is learn to exist in the space of here thereness, which is very, very difficult, which is very existentially unnerving, but it is also necessary so that we can overcome uh, the meaning crisis. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Anchor, uh, Instagram, all these things. And thank you so much for your time.